during the next four sermons that I'm going to preach here at Fresno Central Church, Lord willing, we are going to be speaking about God's message to the church of Laodicea. I've spoken a lot about Bible prophecy in the last several presentations. This series will not be particularly on Bible prophecy. It's going to be on God's special message, not to the world, but to His church in these last days. Probably most of you are aware of the fact that the church of Laodicea is the last church that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. Therefore, knowing that the seven churches represent seven periods of the history of the Christian church from the times of Christ till the end of time, we know that this message is God's last message to His church. Church number seven in the series. So if this is Christ's last message to His church, it would do well for us to listen to the voice of Jesus. I would remind you that this message is not for the world at large, like the three angels' messages. You know, those messages are, yes, meant for the church as well, but they're particularly focused on warning the world about the events that are taking place and what is soon to take place. But the message to the Laodiceans is an internal message. It's a message to the church, to the Christian church in general, and more specifically, to the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, we have a tendency of thinking that these messages actually apply to other people in other churches. But the Spirit of Prophecy has told us explicitly that the message to the Laodicean church applies in a special sense to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, I would like to read the passage that we find in Revelation chapter 3. And uh, then we are not going to study that passage today. We are going to study something else that is related to this passage. Um, we have to go back to history to understand uh, what is going to happen with the church at the end of time. However, I do want to read this passage so we know exactly what the church of Philadelphia, what the church of Laodicea is and the message that God imparts. The message is found in Revelation chapter 3 and verses 14 through 21. And I'm going to read through this without much comment. It says this, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Well, that's a key word. And repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he, he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down 
with my Father on His throne. The, church, the message to the church of the Laodiceans. Now what I would like to do in our study today is go back to the times of Christ. Actually, slightly before the coming of Christ. I would like to go to the times of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is actually proclaiming his message of preparing a people for the first coming of Jesus six months before Jesus began his public ministry. Very important chronological detail. John the Baptist is preaching approximately six months before Jesus begins his public ministry. And I want you to notice the message that John the Baptist imparts. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, and I would like to begin reading at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, now notice the word, repent. Did we find that in Revelation 3? Yes, we did. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then it goes, to, goes on to describe John the Baptist. And then I want to jump down to verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Quite a way to begin a message. Brood of vipers. Now, John the Baptist is calling these people to repent. The question is, who are they? Did you notice? It says here that he's speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, let me ask you, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees quite pious? Were they quite religious? Oh, absolutely. Did they keep the Sabbath? Yes. Did they tithe? Did they eat pork? No. Did they come to church? Yes. Did they fast? Absolutely. They were very, very spiritually oriented. They were very religious people. And so when John the Baptist comes and he says, repent, I'm sure that the first thought in their minds was, repent from what? We're law keepers. We do what God says we're supposed to do. We're the chosen people. We're righteous. So why in the world would we need to repent? Repent from what? You know, you usually repent of sin, don't you? But they certainly did not consider themselves sinners at all. But John the Baptist tears away the veneer and he says, listen. You are a brood of vipers. And by the way, do you know what vipers are? Snakes. Last I knew, snakes breed snakes. Hello? In other words, they were children of whom? Of the great viper, Satan. Now you say, Pastor, wait a minute. You're saying that these Sabbath-keeping, health-reforming, tithe-paying, fasting, righteous people were a brood of vipers born of the great viper himself? That's not what I say. That's what Scripture says. Now, what was their problem? I want you to notice that John the Baptist is going to compare them to a tree. He's going to compare the Jewish nation to a tree. A tree which has many, many leaves. It's a beautiful tree. It's a tree which is attractive to the eyes. But there's a serious problem with this tree. I want you to notice chapter 3 and verse 8. John the Baptist says this, Therefore, 
bear fruits worthy of repentance. What was the problem with the tree? The tree was full of leaves, but it had no what? It had no fruit. By the way, he's speaking here of the Jewish nation as a tree. And he's saying, you know, you have a wonderful veneer, you have, you have wonderful leaves which attract the attention of people, but the problem is you are devoid of fruit. Repent because you are not producing fruit. And then I want you to notice verse 9. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Can you hear the pride in that statement? We have Abraham as our father. We have William Miller as our father. We have Joseph Bates as our father. We have J.N. Andrews as our father. We have Ellen White as our mother. See, I almost blew it there. Do not think to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, don't consider your denominational pride as something great. And then he says, notice the last part of the verse, but I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. By the way, Jesus was not pointing at stones. If you read Ellen White's comment in Desire of Ages, you're going to find that Ellen White says that the Jews considered the Gentiles individuals with stony hearts. In fact, the Jews called the Gentiles stones. They called them swine. How would you like to be called a swine? They called them dogs. In fact, Jesus says it's not good to take the pearls and throw them to the what? To the swine. He says to this Canaanite woman, you know, it's not good to take the bread of the children and give it to the dogs. He was reflecting the ideas of that day and age. In other words, these self-sufficient Jews, they're saying, look, we have Abraham as our father. And we're not like these stones here, these Gentiles who have stony hearts. We have tender hearts. We listen to the voice of God, and we obey the voice of God. Are you catching the picture? Self-righteous people, practicing all the forms of religion, rich and increased with goods, and in need of nothing. A tree with beautiful leaves, ostentatious leaves but when you look closely a tree that is devoid of what devoid of fruit by the way what is the fruit what is the fruit which God expected this tree the Jewish nation to produce if you go with me to the gospel of Luke we have an explanation Luke chapter 3 Luke chapter 3, and I want to begin reading at verse 10. Luke 3 and verse 10. I want you to notice that when John preaches his message, not only are the scribes and Pharisees present there. There are three other groups present listening to the message of John the Baptist. It says there in chapter 3, beginning at verse 10, So the people asked him, saying, after he says, bear fruit, repent because you're not bearing fruit, it says, so the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Let me ask you, is this practical religion? Giving food and giving clothing? Absolutely. Notice verse 12. Then tax collectors, by the way, were they loved? By, by these holy righteous people? Oh no, they were hated by these holy righteous people. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? In other words, what does it mean to produce fruit? How do we produce fruit? 
And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. In other words, don't practice extortion with your fellow human beings. If you love your neighbor, don't practice extortion. Once again, it has to do with what? With practical daily religion. Notice verse 14. Likewise, the soldiers who were Romans, they were Gentiles. The soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Are you noticing what the fruit is? The fruit is practical religion. It's giving food, clothing, not extorting, treating others well. In other words, the fruit is what is spoken of in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Let's read that in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit. The fruit is not keeping God's commandments. The fruit is not keeping the law. The fruit is practical godliness. You see, the Jews, they were doing all of these things. Let me ask you, do you think some of those Jews would have made good Seventh-day Adventists? Ouch. Have you ever heard of the rich young ruler? Was he a, a quite a morally right person externally? Sure. When Jesus says, keep the commandments, what does the young man say? I've kept the commandments since my youth. But then he says, what more do I lack? Was he rich and increased with goods? Yes. He was practicing the Jewish religion. He would have made a good elder in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because he appeared to be morally right. But there was cancer inside. He didn't love his neighbor. See, there you have the practical aspect of religion. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 3. And notice what John the Baptist has to say. Chapter 3, and I would like to read verse 10. It says, and even now, listen to this, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit, what's going to happen to it? Is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's going to happen with a tree that does not produce fruit? It is going to be cut down, and it is going to be thrown into where? Into the fire. And then the message of John the Baptist comes to an end. We don't have a lot in the Bible about what John the Baptist preached, other than these few verses that we've read. He also speaks about the winnowing fan being in the hand of the Messiah, and he was going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Now there's going to be a shaking, right? The wheat would be like the tree that produces what? Fruit. The chaff would be like a tree that does not produce what? That does not produce fruit. There's going to be a shaking, and there's going to be a group cut down and rejected because it does not produce fruit. And John the Baptist is saying, repent because you don't produce fruit. Now the question is, did the people accept the message of John the Baptist? Did the Jewish nation, compared to a tree, say, really, you know, we have a lot of leaves, you know, we have the temple, and we have the law, and we have the covenants, and we have all of these things, but really, you know, we haven't treated other people very well, you know, we're not revealing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, you know, we ought to repent, and we ought to have a change of heart, and start producing fruit in our lives. The question is, as a result of the message of John the Baptist, did the Jewish nation listen to the message and accept it? Well, we who live now in the year 2005 know that they didn't. But when John the Baptist spoke, you didn't know whether the tree was going to bear fruit or not. Whether the axe was going to be laid to the root of the tree, and it was going to be uprooted and thrown into the fire. We don't know at this point whether that was going to be the destiny of the Jewish nation. Now we need to go to a second passage. Go with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. All of these passages are very closely linked and united. Luke 13 
and I would like to begin reading at verse 1. By the way, this is taking place two and a half years into Christ's ministry. That's an important point. It's taking place two and a half years after Jesus began His ministry, which means that John the Baptist preached for six months, half a year. Jesus has preached for two and a half years. How many years have gone by so far? Three years since John began proclaiming His message. Now let, notice this, how the Bible is linked, how these ideas are connected. It says in verse 1, there were present at that season some who told Him, that is about, told Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Evidently they'd come to the temple to sacrifice and Pilate had slain many of the Galileans that had come to worship. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Because the idea was they suffered these things because they were great sinners. But we didn't suffer them because we're righteous. See, that's the idea. Notice verse 3. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is the idea again? They need to what? Repent. Are they a self-righteous people? Say, oh, those people got exactly what they had coming because they were unrighteous. Notice what we find in verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Are you seeing the idea here? Those that, that did not suffer calamities, they feel like they're better, that God has favored them, whereas He's favored all of these, un, has not favored these others because they're very much sinners. But Jesus says in verse 5, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't you think that you're so much more righteous than other people that suffered these calamities, that they suffered these calamities because they were great sinners? He says, if, unless you repent, you're going to suffer the same thing. Are you understanding what it's saying? Same arrogant attitude as we found with the tree in Matthew chapter 3. Now you say, what possible relationship can there be? Jesus now gives a parable to illustrate his point. Notice uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse 6. He also spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. By the way, the vineyard represents the world. All the nations of the world. And what is planted in the vineyard? A fig tree. And now notice, this is three years after John the Baptist started preaching. And he came seeking what? Fruit on it and found none. Now you need to understand that in, uh, in Israel, uh, the fig tree bears fruit and then the leaves come out announcing that the tree has fruit. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, if the tree has leaves, it should have what? It should have fruit. And so, and so this uh, vine dresser represents whom? Jesus. So it says, he comes, sees this fig tree planted in a vineyard. The vineyard is the world. The fig tree represents the same thing as the tree in Matthew chapter 3. And he came seeking fruit on it. And what was the problem? He found none. Three years have gone by. Any fruit on this tree? On this Jewish tree? Absolutely not. Verse 7. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, the vine dresser, the owner of the vineyard, who is God the Father, says to the vine dresser, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree, on this fig tree, and find none. How long has he been looking for fruit? Three years. John the Baptist preached six months. This is two and a half years into the ministry of Jesus. He says, I've come three years looking for fruit, and what was the problem? I have found none. And now notice, cut it down, 
Why does it use up the ground? Is that a similar idea to Matthew 3? Of course it is. Do you have the idea of repentance? The idea of arrogance? The idea of a tree? The possibility of cutting down the tree? Absolutely. Three years have passed. The tree is just as arrogant as ever. It has all of the leaves. It's beautiful to behold. But when people come to it, it has no fruit. It mocks them. In other words, all it does is put on a beautiful front on the outside. And so the owner of the vineyard says, chop it down. But the vine dresser loves the tree. Let's continue reading. Verse 9, verse 8. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also. How many more years did he ask to, for the tree to remain? One more year. How many years were left in the ministry of Jesus at this point? One year, because the ministry of Jesus lasted how long? Three and a half years. And this is two and a half years into his ministry. So he says to the owner of the vineyard, he says, let it stay for this one more year. And notice what he says. He's not going to just leave it there. He says, and I, until I dig around it and fertilize it. In other words, he says, I'm going to dedicate special attention to the tree during this last year. Did Jesus dedicate special attention to the Jewish tree the last year of his ministry? He most certainly did. And then notice what he says. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. And the parable ends. Question. Did the fig tree bear fruit? We know it didn't. But when Jesus told the parable, the parable ends in suspense. Doesn't it? And you wonder, you say, did this fig tree ever bear fruit? Was it cut down? Or was it allowed to remain? That's the question you are left with when the parable comes to an end. Now, do you see the relationship between this passage and Matthew 3? You have a group of people who are arrogant. They are told to repent, that they're not any more righteous than anyone else upon whom calamities have fallen. They have a beautiful external appearance, all of the leaves, but they have no fruit. And so the owner says, chop it down. Why should it occupy the ground? By the way, the owner of the vineyard is God the Father. The fig tree represents the Jewish nation. The vineyard represents all of the nations of the world. The vine dresser is Jesus. And even the time period fits. And Jesus loves his fig tree. He says, don't cut it down yet. Let me, let me work with it for this last year to see if maybe somehow I can get it to produce fruit. And the parable ends. Now there's another passage that is linked with these first two passages. Go in your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 11 and verses 12 through 14. Mark chapter 11 and verses 12 through 14. This is during the last week of the ministry of Jesus before his crucifixion. Actually, it's a couple of days before Jesus goes to the cross. And I want you to notice how interesting this is. Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. It says, now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Notice, Jesus was hungry. What do you do when you're hungry? You look for something to eat, right? Verse 13, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, what would the leaves indicate? The, 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 the beautiful exterior which attracted the attention would say, would, would announce fruit, fruit here. And so Jesus, if you'll notice, 
once again at verse 13 and seen from afar a fig tree having leaves if it by the way if it hadn't had leaves Jesus wouldn't have even gone because the leaves are the announcement that the tree has fruit and Ellen White clarifies in the desire of ages that there were many other trees in the vineyard she says that this fig tree was unique because it actually bore leaves before the other trees the other trees were bare they had no leaves so they attracted no attention and by the way they all represent the Gentiles the Jews received special privileges as they were to bear fruit first because of all of the privileges that they received it was not expected that the Gentiles until they heard the message should bear the fruit so it says he goes to the fig tree hoping that he would find something on it and it says when he came to it he found nothing but what? nothing but leaves and it says for it was not the season for figs what that means is that it was not fig season this tree had produced figs was supposed to produce figs earlier than all of the other trees it was a tree out of season in other words it received special blessings did it not according to Mark what we let in, read in Luke 13 it received special attention and so it was supposed to bear fruit earlier than all of the other trees but it didn't and now I want you to notice what happens verse 14 in response Jesus said to it let no one eat fruit from you ever again and the disciples heard it can you imagine what's going on here by the way do you notice that in all three passages passages there are the self-sufficient ones who compare themselves with sinners it's in Matthew 3 isn't it? we're our children of Abraham we have the covenants we have the promises you know we're not like these stones here in Luke chapter 13 you have the same idea coming through do you think you're better than these people because they suffered a cal calamity and you didn't and in all three passages there's the idea of repentance because there's no fruit these three passages and by the way the tree links all three passages had the tree borne fruit in four years since John the Baptist began to preach absolutely not so Jesus says let no one eat fruit from you ever again and the disciples heard it now allow me to read you a passage in Desire of Ages page 583 where Ella White interprets what the leaves and what the fruit represents she says the Jewish religion with its magnificent temple its sacred altars its mitered priests and impressive ceremonies was indeed fair in outward appearance but humility love and benevolence were lacking are those fruits of the Spirit by the way humility love benevolence they most certainly are she says all of the fig all of the trees in the fig orchard were destitute of fruit see there were other trees all of them were destitute of fruit but the leafless trees raised no expectation and caused no disappointment because they didn't have leaves they weren't attractive they didn't claim much see by these trees the Gentiles were represented they were as destitute as were the Jews of godliness but they had not professed to serve God are you understanding what this is saying a little bit further down on this page 583 Ellen White says Jesus had come to the fig tree hungry to find food what did that mean so he had come to Israel hungering to find in them the fruits of righteousness he had lavished on them his gifts that they might bear fruit for the blessing of the world 
and yet they bore no fruit for the blessing of the world. In spite of, in spite of their religiosity, in spite of having the form of godliness, the appearance of piety, there was no practical religion. There was no love. There was no benevolence. There was no goodness. There was no sharing with those who were destitute and hungering and thirsting for the message and for the blessings of God. I want you to notice what happened to that tree. By the way, do you remember it said the tree would be cut down and thrown into the fire and it dried up? Notice what we find in Mark chapter 11 and verses 20 and 21. It says, Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Wow. What happens when a tree dries up by the roots? That is it. By the way, let me ask you, had God prophesied through John the Baptist that the tree that did not bear fruit would be cut down and thrown into the fire? Yes. Is this the destiny that is taking place to that tree? Absolutely. Why? Because it did not bear what? Because it did not bear fruit. Now we're going to study the message to the church of Laodicea and we're going to find that that message parallels what we've studied this morning to a T. The only difference is that a tree is not used as an illustration. The church of Laodicea represents our church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, not only Fresno Central, all of the Adventist church, Seventh-day Adventist church, in a special way. What is the problem with Laodicea? Same problem? Yes, rich, increased with goods, and in need of nothing. Don't we have special institutions that the world doesn't have? Educational system, hospital system, publishing ministry, unparalleled message, principles of health. I mean, we've got it all. Is it just so, is it just possible that we could fall into the same mistake that the Jews fell into. That they felt self-sufficient because of all of the external aspects of religion, whereas the internal piety of the Spirit is lacking. I believe so. We're going to notice in our study that Jesus says to Laodicea, repent. And I can imagine Laodicea saying, repent of, repent of what? <laughs> I'm rich and increased with good and in need of nothing. Let me, let me ask you folks. It's awful quiet in here. See, I told you I was going to preach to the church today. Not studying the message for the world, but the message for the church. Which we need in these last days. It's the last message of Jesus to the church. Does Jesus say to Laodicea, repent? Yes, he does. Repent from what? Repent from not bearing what? Fruit. You say, how do you know that? Because in the message to the church of Laodicea, Jesus comes knocking. At what time does he come knocking? You Have you noticed? We read the passage to begin today. At what time does Jesus come? He knocks at the door, listen up, at supper time. In other words, Jesus wants to what? He wants Laodicea to feed him. Any relationship with uh, what we studied about the tree? But where is Jesus? He's not inside, he's what? Outside. You say, how do you know it's at supper time? Because Jesus says, I will come in and sup with him. I will have supper with him. Jesus hungers and thirsts from Laodicea the same things that he hungered and thirsted for from the Jewish nation. In fact, Ellen White says that we are repeating the history of the Jewish nation. By the way, what would be equivalent to cutting the tree down and throwing it in the fire 
in Revelation 3. Jesus says, repent or else I will what? I will spew you out of my mouth. Is that equivalent to cutting down the tree? Yes it is. There's a whole series of parallels between what happened then and what happens today. He says, actually the Greek says, I am, a, be, I am about to spew you out of my mouth. And folks, we cannot consider that simply because we're Seventh-day Adventists and we have God's end time message, that that guarantees that this is it. This is the church. And there's not the possibility, and I know I need to be careful about this, the possibility that the Adventist church cannot go down the same road as the Jewish nation. Is there that possibility? There most certainly is. And it's not because of all of the external things that we have. It's because the internal piety that is manifested in the fruit of the Spirit is missing. Amazing. Before I conclude this morning, I would like to read uh, page 584 of Desire of Ages. Listen to this. The warning is for all time. The warning of this last uh, experience, this parable. Christ's act in cursing the tree, which was an acted parable, which his own power had created, stands as a warning to all churches and to all Christians. No one can live the law of God without ministering to others. But there are many who do not live out Christ's merciful, unselfish life. Some who think themselves excellent Christians do not understand what constitutes service for God. They plan and study to please themselves. They act only in reference to self. Time is of value to them only as they can gather for themselves. In all the affairs of life, this is their object. Not for others, but for themselves do they minister. God created them to live in a world where unselfish service must be performed. See, the world is hungering and thirsting for that. He designed them to help their fellow men in every possible way. But self is so large that they cannot see anything else. They are not in touch with humanity. Those who thus live for self are like the fig tree, which made every pretension but was fruitless. They observe the forms of worship, but without repentance or faith. In profession... They honor the law of God, but obedience is lacking. They say, but do not do. In the sentence pronounced on the fig tree, Christ demonstrates how hateful in his eyes is this vain pretense. He declares that the, listen to this, he declares that the open sinner is less guilty than is he who professes to serve God, but who bears no fruit to his glory. Those are powerful words. What are we doing for the Lord? We come to church on Sabbath. We don't work. Many of us tithe. We don't eat pork. Many perhaps are vegans. We know all about the principles of health. And yet, what are we doing for the world? What are we doing for our community? What are we doing in revealing the practical godliness, the character of Jesus to a world who is hungering and thirsting for something better than what they have? I'd like to end by reading a parable of Jesus and making a few remarks about it. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, and you know this parable very well, but it illustrates this same principle. By the way, next Sabbath we're going to talk about the parable of the prodigal son. You say, now what does that have to do with Laodicea? A lot. 
that parable is not really about the prodigal son, it's about the son who was lost at home. See, we usually study the story of the prodigal son, we say, how wonderful, you know, he came back home, his father embraced him, and they lived happily ever after. And we forget that the main point of the parable didn't have to do with the younger son, but with the older one. Who was at home and served his father, it knew like a hireling who says, I've served you all these years, you owe me something, dad. Are you following me? That whole story has the purpose. And of course, then you have the, the Gentile, so to speak, which is his brother. Do you know, Pharisee always compares his piety with the piety of others. Let's notice that. Luke chapter 10. And I want to begin at verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable. To some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Hello. Any relationship with uh, the fig tree? Absolutely. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Were they both, uh, did, did they both come to worship God? Sure. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. How did the Pharisee look upon the tax collector? That miserable IRS agent. I wish a bolt of lightning would fall from heaven and burn him up. Hope we don't feel like that towards the IRS agents. We have to love them too, you know. But the Jews, they hated the tax collectors because they were Jews in the employ of Rome. Imagine that. Verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Hello. He prayed what? With himself. In other words, his prayer did go beyond his head. Which was very big, incidentally. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Who is he comparing himself with? With others. You know, when I compare myself with others, I'm always better than they are. You can have that, you can know that for sure. But when I compare myself with God, I'm a worm. <laughs> Albert, I didn't expect you to say that I meant so loud. <laughs> so it says the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. And then he's going to make a list of all of his, uh, all of the leaves that he has. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. By the way, don't anybody go out of here today and say, Pastor Bor says you're not supposed to tithe. Or give the church budget. We're supposed to tithe and keep the Sabbath and practice the laws of hell. But if that is not accompanied by the practical religion of Christ, it's worthless. You have to have both. You have to have leaves and fruit. By the way, the leaves are the main mechanism that the tree uses to bear fruit. The leaves are the food making elements of the tree. For those of you, I see Phil saying, yes, yes, Pastor, you got it right. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Could he have made a good Seventh-day Adventist? What do you think? Yeah? Maybe a leader in the church? Sure. I believe so. 
but there was something terribly wrong. Verse 13, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. You can imagine him standing there with his head down, embarrassed to be in the presence of God. But beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. Was he repentant? Was the first guy repentant? No, he was self-sufficient. See, that's the problem with Laodicea. It's a self-sufficient church because of all that it has. And the Adventist denomination is greatly blessed. It has an enviable organizational system. Enviable, enviable system of, mi of ministers and leaders. It has an enviable uh, health system and publishing ministry and educational system. Incomparable beliefs. Incomparable lifestyle and practices. But folks, all of that is worthless unless the fruit of Christ's life is seen in us. Verse 14, Jesus gives the lesson to the parable. He says, I tell you, this man, that is the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know Ellen White says that the substance of the teachings of Jesus is the denial of self. You look at everything Jesus taught, the essence or the substance is the denial of self. Selflessness, giving, without expecting anything in return. And so we begin our study on the church of Laodicea by understanding the experience that Israel went through when Jesus came to this world. Perhaps before I end, I should read one final passage. In case you didn't catch what I'm talking about, the meaning of what I'm talking about, go with me to Matthew chapter 23. And this will be our last passage. Matthew chapter 23. This is the woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. And I want you to notice what their problem was. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Can you imagine what it must be like to pay tithe on cumin seeds? Nine for me, one for the Lord. Nine for me, one for the Lord. They were sticklers for detail. But then he says, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Do you see practical religion there? These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He says, yes, you need both. Not tithe or love, but love the tithes. Verse 24, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Do you know that they actually did that? Because they were forbidden from eating anything unclean? The Pharisees, they would strain their water just in case a gnat had gotten in the water. And if they swallowed the gnat, they would be eating something unclean. But Jesus says, you, you strain the gnat and you swallow a camel. Verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, and inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. How many of you, when you wash your dishes, you only wash them on the outside? Nice and sparkling and shiny. You look at the light. Oh, they're so shiny and sparkling outside. But you didn't wash them inside. What's the use? It's useless. Jesus is saying, outside you're okay. But inside there's something wrong. There's a conflict between outside and inside. And we're going to notice in our study of Laodicea, folks, that Laodicea has something hot and has something cold. Because lukewarm water is a combination of hot and cold. Laodicea has something hot and something cold. Do you know what it has hot? 
works. Do you know what it has cold? The heart. And the combination of a cold heart producing works, selfish works, self-righteous works, is what? Lukewarm and nauseating to Jesus Christ. Well, I hope you'll continue coming. I know this is, this is strong, strong stuff, strong medicine. But it's Christ's message to his last church. And we can say, oh no, that's not the way I am. Or we can come to terms with what Jesus says and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and transform our hearts and to change us and to receive the rebuke of Jesus. Because this message is not meant to discourage the church. Jesus says, he who I love, I rebuke and chase. This is a message of love because he does not want to see us. He does not want to see his church perish. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we've spoken about a solemn message that you have imparted to your church. To the Seventh-day Adventist church, Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist church. The strong message, strong medicine, but Father, the medicine is to cure us of selfishness. I ask, Father, that you will help each person gathered here today to take this message to heart. Father, I ask that your Spirit will speak in clear tones to each person. And that, Lord, our heart might be broken. We might have a conversion experience revival and reformation in our lives that the world might see who Jesus really is. Help us, Lord, not to be less strict in all of the things that we do, but give us a different spirit that leads us to do these things. A spirit of love, a spirit of mercy, a spirit of kindness and benevolence. We thank you, Father, for having been with us and for speaking to us. Because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.